this topic has been one that's been requested for a little while. It's a, a biggie in our society right now because so many people are struggling with these kinds of symptoms, whether they've been officially diagnosed with ADHD or not. It seems to be a common struggle for people. And I also see a lot of misinformation floating around about ADHD, um, a lot of self-diagnosing too. And I think it's just really important for us to fully understand what is this thing that we're calling ADHD? How does that look in the brain and in the body? And really finding the most effective ways to address this. So I'm excited to present on this topic. I'm going to be going through a lot of information. I'm a big fan of trying to give you the 10,000 foot view per se. And then, like I said, I'm recording this. So I'm more than happy to share that recording with you. So don't feel like you have to take every detail in this first go round. We are uh, packing a lot of information into a short amount of time. So you can rewatch the recording as much as you want. Happy to also share slides if you request them. So we'll get the details you need. And then, of course, if you have follow-up questions or anything, I'm more than happy to help answer those. Okay. So the this presentation, just to give you a brief little overview, we're going to be looking at the assessment piece and how important this is to really understand what we're dealing with. Uh, we found that there are a variety of different things that can contribute to ADHD, whether that's in the brain, whether that's in the body. Uh, sometimes there's differential diagnoses, meaning that there's other conditions that mimic ADHD symptoms per se, but may actually require a different approach, right? And then we'll be getting into some details about how we can use an integrative treatment approach to most effectively address this ADHD, the various different symptoms and the contributing variables. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about brain-based therapies for those that aren't as familiar, but specifically going into how these can be used for ADHD. And then we'll dive into some natural interventions as well that people can do even from home. Okay. So the first thing I think is really important to understand, and um, oftentimes is overlooked in our society, is actually looking at the official diagnostic criteria. So. ADHD is often diagnosed using the DSM-5. So this is the diagnostic manual uh, that we tend to use for mental health. And there's specific criteria that you have to meet to officially get diagnosed from a professional. Oftentimes this isn't fully being used. People are just kind of willy-nilly diagnosing based on a set of symptoms um, so I figure it's really important to have a general idea of what these symptoms are. And then we can look at the overall, like how this manifests for each individual. And don't get me wrong, I'm not a big diagnosis person. I actually really prefer to look at each individual as an individual. And one of the things I love about the brain-based approach is that we can look at them at their specific brain patterns, right? And instead of saying, oh, you fit this diagnosis, we can just say, oh, we see these brainwave patterns or we see these imbalances in the body and then uh, we can address those. But it is important to understand how these symptoms can show up on both the inattentive side and what we call hyperactive impulsive side of things. Okay, so officially, if you are a child up to age 16, then you must meet six or more of the symptoms in one or both of these columns. Okay. And then those that are 17 and older just need five or more. So on the inattention side, we're seeing that people tend to struggle to pay close attention to details. They may be making, you know, careless mistakes. They have trouble sustaining attention. 
either in tasks or in play. They struggle to really listen when spoken to directly. They may have trouble following through on instructions and have a lot of unfinished tasks. They may struggle to organize these tasks and activities and avoid ones that are requiring really sustained mental effort, especially if it's not something that we're super interested in. We can also see a lot of forgetfulness and losing things and just distractibility. So if somebody has five or more as an adult, six or more as a child in the inattentive, then they meet the criteria for inattentive type, right? And then on the hyperactive impulsive side, we may see a lot of fidgeting or tapping hands and feet, squirming in our seat, really trouble sitting still, uh, maybe leaving our seat in situations where we're really expected to stay seated. In kiddos, you tend to see running around, climbing on things, rolling around on the floor. <laughs> in adults, a lot of times we want to do that, but we recognize that it's not appropriate. So we hold ourselves in our seats and then we just feel that internal restlessness, right? Now, this can also make it difficult to really just enjoy and engage in quiet leisure activities. It's like we're driven by a motor, like Energizer Bunny, right? Talking excessively, sometimes blurting out answers before someone finishes their question or interrupting others, just difficulty waiting their turn, right? So again, five or six or more of these uh, meets the criteria for that predominant type. And then those that meet five or six or more in each of these, then they would be classified as the combined type. Okay. So that's the diagnostic criteria. Now you can see that a lot of these symptoms too, we're going to be going into other things that also contribute to these symptoms, because this is a pretty broad, generalized set of symptoms, and you don't even have to meet all of them, right? So this is where we want to dive a little bit deeper. So in kids, you know, this is going to impact a lot of areas of their life, and one of the diagnostic pieces is understanding that these symptoms are showing up in two or more settings in their life. So if they are just struggling at school and nowhere else, then that officially doesn't meet the criteria. Um, and we want to look at what's going on at school that causes them to struggle more, right? Or if it's only happening at home. But more often than not, you know, they're struggling in many different areas. You know, they're going to have trouble with schoolwork, grades. They may have difficulty with friendships due to more of the impulsivity and hyperactivity or not always understanding kind of the boundaries, interrupting those kind of things. Um, they may struggle with emotional regulation. And so this can lead to more of the feelings of anxiety and frustration. They may have some behavioral challenges, especially in the classroom, but also at home. This can put some strain on family relationships. And then we do see that, you know, ADHD starting in childhood, if it's really not managed or they don't really learn the skills they need, then we see that going into adulthood. Now in adults, it's going to show up a little bit different. Oh, there we go. And so we're going to see more of course, issues in the workplace or if they are in school, um, then we're going to see challenges with focus, organization. It's going to affect our performance and sometimes can get in the way of career advancement. We may struggle with relationships due to the same things, impulsivity, uh, emotional challenges, um, difficulty listening. Again, a lot of these things, they're not really intentional, um, but it can be taken personally and can be challenging for the other family members. Uh, time management can be a challenge, especially in terms of procrastination and planning ahead. There's uh, sometimes a resulting low self-esteem because these 
symptoms can cause us to feel frustrated with ourselves or inadequate. Unfortunately, when we have struggled with these kind of symptoms as a child, then sometimes I've met a lot of people that think they're stupid or they thought they were stupid when they were young. And it's actually quite the opposite. ADHD often is associated with high intelligence, um, but because of the way the system was set up, then they, they interpreted that as, oh, I'm not as smart as the other kids, right? Now, we also may see co-occurring disorders. It's actually uh, common to see co-occurring anxiety, depression, substance abuse, and some other conditions in conjunction with the ADHD. And again, some of that is actually overlapping where we see you know, the same root in the brain that's manifesting these different symptoms. So this is also where I like to get to the roots so that we don't have 10 different diagnoses and we can just say, okay, here's this common root. Let's address that. And then of course, this is going to impact daily life in many different ways. Now, I also like to look at strengths. So I happen to believe that ADHD can be quite a strength for people and it can be almost like a way of thinking, a way of being, almost like a personality type. And wielded well, it can be a great strength, okay? So we do see that those with ADHD symptoms often also show a lot of creativity and innovation. Um, when they're really interested in something, they can also hyper-focus. They can dive in and really be productive. They can also be more adaptable and flexible than a lot of the general population. They can stick and move and really excel in dynamic environments. A lot of times they have a really strong intuition and they also are more compassionate, empathetic, right? emotionally sensitive. And then we can also see just a lot of persistence and resilience. So I think that, again, if we can just look at, okay, what's getting in our way, right? It's not that the whole ADHD is bad, but how do we really amplify and utilize these strengths and also address some of the areas that are getting in our way? And then I always like to show that there's some pretty cool famous people <laughs> that have either actually come out as having ADHD or are suspected to have had ADHD. So like in the case of Albert Einstein, we don't know if he was diagnosed with ADHD because that wasn't a diagnosis back then. Um, but a lot of his behaviors and the way he was, it's suspected that he would have fit criteria for ADHD. So you can just see that there's a lot of individuals in various fields who are pretty accomplished and pretty awesome. And so it's just an example of how learning to, to wield it well, we can really excel in life. So transitioning to assessments. Now, uh, those who know me know that I am a big believer in comprehensive assessments. I really like to get a more complete picture of what's going on and also really getting to the nitty gritty roots rather than just as uh, Daniel Amen said, shooting darts in the dark. So the first thing that is the most common assessment used to diagnose ADHD are symptom questionnaires. And these can be self-reports, they might be parent-teacher reports, or they might be an actual clinical interview with a healthcare professional. And so these can be really helpful for just determining what symptoms people are struggling with, what severity level. They're also a great way to track progress over time. But we also have to recognize that they're limited as an assessment tool when they're just used on their own. And they're also highly subject subjective, right? So we see this sometimes where like a teacher may have a a certain view of a child, and then that's going to skew their reports of the child, right? So all that said, this is just um, something that we need to 
take in conjunction with the rest of the overall assessment. But unfortunately, a lot of our world just base, bases the diagnosis on the symptom questionnaires alone. So the next level up, which more people do than just the symptom assessments, is the neurocognitive testing. And this can be a more objective way to look at our functioning. It's very focused on the cognitive functions, of course, uh, but it can be a good assessment of various different types of attention, executive function, memory, processing speed, and it can also be retested over time. So it can be a, a step up as far as giving us some additional objective information, but neither of these tells us why people are struggling, what's underneath. <laughs> I, we see the symptoms, but why are they there? So this is where I think the functional brain imaging can come in to be really helpful, start to fill in some of the gaps. So the EEG is going to show us some of the electrical patterns in the brain. I like to look at the actual raw EEG, the squiggly lines, because we can see where there's just constant patterns throughout. We can see bursts of activity. We can see epileptiform, which is like seizure activity. Uh, we can look at the shapes of the brain waves. There's a lot of information in there that for the trained eye can be like a story, right? However, it's really hard for the general population to understand all the squiggly lines without all the training. And that's where the QEEG can be really beautiful because it gives us these pretty pictures that lay out the data in front of us. It can give us this visual representation of the activity across the different regions of the brain, different frequencies. And it also gives us some additional information that the raw EEG doesn't, in that this one is compared to what we call a normative or a neurotypical database. So this is where we can compare, for example, we have a seven-year-old kiddo, we can compare their brain to a whole database of other seven-year-olds, and we can see where they fall on this like bell curve per se. So that can be helpful because a lot of times when people are feeling and functioning at their best, they're within this certain range of activity. And we're not trying to make them all exactly the same. We want the individuality, but we do find that when they're way out here, more often than not, it's getting in their way. So this can give us a, a good tool to really see some patterns where we're seeing like too much or too little of different brain waves and in what part of the brain. And these are some of the profiles that we see with ADHD. So first and foremost, you can see that it's not just one <laughs> So we tend to also look at ADHD as one diagnosis and everybody fits into that box. But even looking at the brain, there's multiple different brainwave patterns that can manifest into symptoms associated with ADHD. Okay, so one of the most common ones we see is excessive theta brainwaves. So this is a slower brainwave. And we tend to see it more often than not in the front of the brain doesn't have to be, but that's the most common pattern. Now, data brainwaves tend to be associated with like some daydreaming, a little more in la-la land, okay, so poor focus, and you can imagine this is going to create some difficulties with attention, planning, executive functions. And then with that, we can see something called a high theta-beta ratio. So when you have a high ratio, it means that you've got more theta than beta, and it's going to be a more drastic difference between the two. So if we have too much theta and not enough beta, then it's also going to contribute to difficulty with a lot of the cognitive processes. We're in a little bit more of a drowsy or less focused state low beta tends to be a little bit more of the focus frequency. So if we're not producing enough of that, then we tend to see more like impulsive behaviors, 
difficulty with self-regulation, and just difficulty with focus in general. Now we can also see this pattern show up in alpha. So it's not always theta, it can be alpha. And alpha is also a little on the slower side of the brainwave range. And so it does indicate that the brain's not actively engaged in cognitive tasks, but it's not quite as internally focused or off, you know, in la la land. Um, but we do see that when there's too much of this alpha, it tends to manifest as more of like an apathy or just like, blah, don't really feel like doing it. And um, it's going to have a lot of the same challenges with overall cognitive function as excessive theta. Then we can also see what's called slow alpha. So slow alpha, alpha normally has a range of nine to 12 Hertz. But if we're seeing alpha more in like an eight to 8.5 or below, then that's also going to be associated with a little slower processing, more disengagement and sluggishness. Okay, so in these cases, you know, we we want to look at why is the alpha slow and do we need to help boost that up? Now, sometimes we can see this as excessive delta. And usually when there's excessive delta, this is more of like a structural thing. It can be um, damage to gray or white matter in the brain. Uh, we may see more extreme fogginess and fatigue with this. Um, sometimes it's also related to sleep issues. So again, this is going to be something that contributes to ADHD symptoms. But if it's someone diagnosed with ADHD and the only pattern they have is excessive delta, then I'm going to be digging a little deeper to see what else is going on. Now, we also have another kind of ADHD pattern that is more on the beta side. So beta are faster frequencies. We tend to see more of like a spindling beta in the 15 to 20 hertz range. And this is more of, you know, something that can be utilized to hyperfocus, but it can also be a distractibility. So this is usually part of our salience network. It helps us determine what's important to focus on. And when our brain is overactive, it's deeming everything relevant. Everything is important. So we want to take it all in at once. <laughs> and then we're going to be distractible. It's harder to focus on just one thing. We also see this pattern overlap a little more with anxiety, worry, the heightened stress responses. And uh, this may also contribute to more of the challenges with like impulse control and some like difficulty sitting still. And then another one we see is called mu, mu rhythm. This is a, a very specific brain wave that arises from the sensory motor strip, which is kind of like if you were wearing a, a headband, right? And this one tends to be linked to mirror neuron activity. So the mu rhythm can be a form of disengagement. I always see it kind of like a turtle going into its shell, right? Um, and then this one is where we tend to see a little bit more challenges socially. There's a little more lack of awareness of social boundaries and, you know, the space that you should give somebody when you're talking to them. Sometimes this also overlaps with more of like a mild autism presentation. And then, of course, we want to get even more specific. This is where the Loretta comes in. So this is a functional neuroimaging that essentially takes all of that data and runs all these complex algorithms to provide this 3D reconstruction of the brain activity. And this is going to allow us to be a lot more specific. We can see exactly where activity is coming from. We can get a lot more targeted both in the assessment as well as the intervention. 
And then we can get to deeper regions, including the subcortical, which is, you know, the cortex is the outer layer. Subcortical is kind of like the yolk of the egg. Okay. And this is important because a lot of the brain regions that we've seen with Loretta that tend to be dysregulated are these very specific regions. It's not just frontal cortex or, you know, parietal, it's going to be uh, a specific region. And some of these are deeper down in the brain. So Rodman area 10 is one of the really common ones that we see associated with ADHD. This is part of the prefrontal cortex and it tends to be related to executive functions like decision-making, planning, impulse control, so when we have dysregulation in this area, you can imagine those functions are going to be impacted. We also see Broadman area nine right next door. This is our dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So a little more to the side. This is uh, related to similar functions, but a little more on the sides of attention and working memory, uh, especially the recall part of memory. And it also plays a role in our cognitive flexibility. We also see Broadman area 44. And so this is going to lead to some difficulties with language processing. And it does overlap with some of the prefrontal regions. So it is going to play a role in executive functions, uh, but especially where our speech and our language overlap with our executive. Now, Broadman area six, this is the premotor and supplementary motor areas. And these do play a role in planning and coordination, but more related to our action, our movement. Okay, so when we see impairments in this, then again, it's going to be more difficult to maybe sit still and to inhibit the impulsive movements. Um, this region is also one of the ones that has mirror neurons, a larger quantity of mirror neurons, which are related to social engagement and social mirroring. So you can imagine that can create some of the challenges with social connections. And then Broadman area 32, this is one of the most common ones that I've seen, and that's the anterior cingulate cortex. This is kind of like our stick shift for our attention. So it's determining where we put our attention at each moment. And uh, when this is dysregulated, then we see, of course, challenges, both with just paying attention as well as the shifting attention and complex attention. Now, this part of our brain is also highly involved in regulating our limbic system, as well as the prefrontal cortex. The limbic system is where we have a lot of our emotional experience. So when these other regions that are supposed to be regulating that are impaired, that's where we see some of the, you know, emotional dysregulation come in. Okay. But it's of course going to be different than like an actual mood disorder where the issue is more on the emotion itself. This is more on the uh, regulatory parts of the brain. And then we can go even deeper to a lot of these subcortical regions. So we've seen that the striatum has a, a role in ADHD. It plays a big role in our reward processing, motivation, motor control. We've also seen some impairments with the nucleus accumbens, also part of the reward circuitry. Uh, interestingly, this is one of the ones that plays a, a big role in addiction. So where we see some comorbidities between ADHD and a predisposition towards addiction, this is one of the regions that tends to overlap there. We also see the thalamus sometimes is struggling a bit, and this is a kind of like the triage center of the brain. So uh, it plays a big role in interpreting our environment, our sensory information, and uh, really triaging where all those signals go 
between the brain and the body. Now, the amygdala is a biggie for emotional experiences, um, and we do sometimes see some challenges with the amygdala that would be contributing to more of the emotional dysregulation. Uh, this is usually when we see comorbid anxiety, right? So we see somebody that maybe was diagnosed with ADHD, but also struggles with anxiety. And then the hippocampus, this is a primary region for attention, learning, short-term memory, and spatial awareness. So uh, we may see some, some challenges in those areas if this part is struggling. The substantia nigra and ventral tegmental area, these regions play a big role in dopamine. So the dopaminergic system and that's also going to play a role in our motivation and reward processing. You'll see a little bit later that dopamine dysregulation can be playing a role in ADHD. And so one of the ways that we can help improve the dopamine balance is making sure that the brain regions that are responsible for that dopamine production and management are functioning at their best. And then the last one here is the cerebellum. So we've seen that the cerebellum is like playing a role in coordination of our brain and our body. And it's a lot of our interconnection between the brain and the body. But we've also seen that it is its own little brain in there. So cerebellum actually means little brain. <laughs> And it's got a whole map just like the cortex does where each region plays its own little role. And we've seen that when there's impairments with the cerebellum with ADHD, it also contributes to impairments with focus and especially things like processing speed. And then we also wanna look at connectivity. So <laughs> you can see it's getting pretty complex, even just this one ADHD diagnosis. There's a lot of things to look at. We found that connectivity can play a big role in our processing speed and how brain regions are communicating. And so some of the things that we've seen with ADHD is there may be a reduction of long range connectivity. So um, when there aren't these strong connections between those more distant brain regions, then that can impact a lot of our attention and executive functions. We sometimes see alterations in the default mode network, which is the network that tends to be active when we're at rest or when our mind is wandering. And so you can imagine this tends to be overactive with ADHD, especially the more inattentive type. And sometimes we've seen this response where the DMN actually kicks in stronger when they try to engage in a task. So typically we would want to see that kind of calm down and we see our central executive network kick in when we've got a task in front of us or we're trying to listen to the teacher but sometimes we see the opposite in those that have a diagnosis of ADHD, where the DMN actually kicks up even more and makes it even harder to pay attention, okay? So this is a network that tends to be a key target when we're working with ADHD. Sometimes we've seen alterations in the frontal parietal network, and this is also a region really important for attention and particularly switching between tasks, switching attention. So we have seen a weaker connectivity in ADHD. And um, this is also one of the ones that tends to overlap with uh, predisposition towards substance or any kind of addiction because it's kind of part of that whole reward processing. Now, this next one's very interesting because uh, gamma connectivity, gamma is a, a fascinating brainwave that has been linked to really high level cognitive functions, integration of information, memories, ideas. It's uh, associated with 
aha moments and bright ideas out of the blue. And sometimes we actually see more gamma connectivity in those with ADHD. And that could be a really beautiful thing. This could also be where they can be very creative and innovative and have these amazing ideas. Uh, the challenge is when this gets too far, then it can also make it harder to um, really inhibit things like impulsivity. Uh, but in balance, this could be one of the things that's part of the gift, right? Now, there's also some studies that are showing reduced alpha coherence. And this is where the brain is not as able to filter out stimuli that's not important or irrelevant. So again, it's trying to bring it all in at once, and then it's going to be hard to filter through all of it to really pay attention to the task at hand. So all that said, that's the brain side of things. You can see that it's pretty complex even on the brain side, and that's why we want to be making sure we're getting individual to each person, what exactly is going on for them. But to further complicate it, there's often these physiological imbalances in the body that tend to contribute to ADHD symptoms. So we can see metabolic issues where we're not generating, utilizing, or regulating energy or other resources that would allow our brain to really function at its best. We can see dysfunction within the mitochondria. Our mitochondria are the little energy production centers, right? High school uh, science class, we all learned it's the powerhouse of the cell. And so it's really important that these are functioning well to produce the energy that all of our cells and all of our neurons need to function properly, okay? So we, we want to make sure those are up and running at their best. Inflammation is sometimes observed. And inflammation, of course, is going to affect the flow of information in the brain and the communication between brain regions. Neurotransmitter imbalances. Uh, dopamine is a very common one with ADHD where we'll see some dopamine dysregulation, and uh, sometimes on the deficient side. Serotonin sometimes is observed to be imbalanced as well, and both of these are playing a big role in our overall cognitive functions and um, kind of our attention, our motivation, our mood, and our energy. Now, we may also see impaired methylation, so if we're not methylating properly, then that's going to impact things like our genetic expression. It's going to impact our neurotransmitter production and our overall brain function. And our brain and our body aren't able to clean out the stuff that needs to be cleaned out for them to function smoothly. Gastrointestinal imbalances are also very common we may see something called dysbiosis, where there's an imbalance of the bacteria and uh, organisms in the gut. We may also see intestinal permeability, where we have too much of that. We should have intestinal permeability to an extent. That's how things get in and out, like nutrients. But when we have too much permeability, then things can leak into the bloodstream before they're fully processed. And that can lead to things like food sensitivities because our body detects those as pathogens. They're bad. We need to attack them. And then we see this uh, inflammation starting to occur in the brain and the body, right? So again, you can see already how a lot of these actually intertwine and they can contribute to one another. Now, if our gut isn't working properly to break down nutrients, or if we're not taking in the nutrients in the first place, then we can also see impairments uh, in our brain development, our brain function. Uh, we need appropriate nutrients to produce our neurotransmitters and hormones. So um, this is another area that sometimes we'll see is a contributing variable, especially with kiddos. 
Now, I also mentioned that sometimes there's other things that overlap with ADHD symptoms. And this is particularly challenging to diagnose in kids because sometimes these various different things manifest as similar behavioral activity, but they don't really have all the words to describe what they're feeling. So uh, I see sometimes kids with anxiety that are diagnosed with ADHD, and then they're put on a stimulant, and the stimulant makes the anxiety worse, <laughs> right? So these are uh, important to really look at, factor out. They may be a different disorder that they don't actually have ADHD, but they have these other disorders instead, or they may be coexisting where we have ADHD and anxiety, right? So some of the things that I tend to see overlapping a lot with ADHD symptoms are anxiety disorders, various different types of learning challenges like dyslexia, dysgraphia. Um, these are going to impact academic performance, right? Um, and yet it's not the attention specifically, it's these challenges that are getting in the way of paying attention in that way. Sensory processing is similar in that if we're either overloaded with the sensory information or we're having a hard time taking information in through various sensory you know, pathways, so like we have trouble with auditory attention, right? That could be an impairment of the auditory functioning as opposed to the actual ADHD, just general attention. Now, we also see traumatic and excessive stress tending to uh, contribute to similar symptoms, especially when we see a little more of the emotional dysregulation, uh, where the limbic system can be hyperactive and we're feeling in this fight or flight state all the time. It's going to be hard to sit still if your brain thinks that you should be running from a tiger at that moment. So this is going to contribute to some of that like agitation, hyperactivation, and yet it has a different root. Now on the flip side, sometimes we see dissociation. So as a response to this stress, we may go to the freeze response. And in the freeze response, if it's at more extremes, we kind of dissociate, meaning we, we like disconnect from ourselves sometimes can feel like um, disconnected from our bodies and get a little bit spacey in those moments. So again, that can look like ADHD, more of the inattentive, but actually has the traumatic or excessive stress at the root. And that's what needs to be addressed rather than just stimulating the brain, right? In these cases, we likely need to calm it down. Now, I also see a lot of concussions that go undiagnosed. I have seen people come in with uh, brains showing injuries from when they were four years old and, you know, fell off the swing set onto their head. <laughs> and it was never even diagnosed as a concussion, right? So we see this a lot um, where people may have even lived most of their life thinking they had ADHD. And then we find that they actually have evidence of a brain injury, of a concussion that led to these ADHD symptoms. But the nice thing about that is when we can address it in the brain, when we can really give the brain what it needs to heal, then it's not this like diagnosis that they have to live with the rest of their life. It's about really getting to the root of where the brain is needing some additional help and helping it heal up. So this is something to watch out for with kids too, because they're running around bashing their head on everything. <laughs> so um, it's important to, to do these assessments and see, like, do they have a concussion? And unfortunately, a lot of our hospital systems and urgent care, they, they don't always do really comprehensive assessments for concussion. So most of them actually go based off of symptoms alone. Sometimes you'll get a CT scan, um, but 
even the imaging that they use often won't show you just a concussion. They show you if there's like brain bleeds or really significant structural impairments. Uh, but the functional imaging is a really great way to see more of the impairments in how the neurons are firing after a potential injury. Now, ODD, oppositional defiant disorder, or conduct disorder, these uh, are other diagnoses in the DSM that can have some behavioral challenges that overlap with ADHD. Uh, sometimes these also have some other roots. It's not just a genetic thing, but there may be some trauma underlying that as well, or some other variables that need to be looked at. We can see sleep challenges. Uh, uh, of course, if they're not sleeping very well, then that's going to cause the brain to be a little more spacey the next day, right? We all know what it's like when we don't sleep well, or um, our brain's just not firing at 100% the day after. And so if this is happening on a regular basis, then that's going to mimic a lot of ADHD symptoms. But again, it's not about stimulating the brain. It's about helping you sleep better. <laughs> so there's other autoimmune reactions like PANS and PANDAS that can affect some of our dopamine and norepinephrine. And that's going to contribute to some similar symptoms related to reward, mood, and some attention processes. We may see adrenal fatigue and burnout, and we may also see some non-epileptic seizure activity sometimes. This is more rare, but uh, when people have these like blackouts or attention lapses, uh, it can actually be seizure activity. So all that said, <laughs> you can see why I love doing a comprehensive assessment to see exactly what's going on for each individual and work together with a whole team to really discover what's going to be the best path forward for each individual. And that's where we'll get into some interventions. So the most common that most people know about for ADHD are medications. And medications can be helpful. I'm not against medications. Uh, but I also think that they can be overprescribed. Uh, I think these kinds of medications, it's really important that people just be fully educated about them so they can make their own decision. So things like methylphenidate, uh, Ritalin, Concerta, these are known to increase dopamine and norepinephrine in the brain, which can be helpful if you have dopamine deficiency. Uh, it's also important to realize that they can decrease theta, increase alpha, and increase beta. Those are the most common EEG patterns that we've seen. So, for example, if somebody has an alpha type ADHD where they already have too much alpha, or beta type where they already have too much beta, then this may not be the ideal fit for them. Uh, but somebody who has too much theta and that's their primary type, then maybe it could be really helpful. A lot of people really struggle with some of the side effects of these medications. So that's something to take into account is um, the side effects that you may have to deal with as a result. The amphetamines like Adderall and Vyvanse, these also boost some various neurotransmitters. They're shown to decrease theta and increase beta and have some similar side effects, but slightly different. The main thing that I think is important for people to be educated about with stimulant medications is that there are some risks. And this isn't always, um, people aren't informed of the risks as much as they should be. And uh, it's marketed as a very, very safe thing for kids. But we have seen several studies that are showing some potential risks in using stimulant medications, especially in the developing brain. So just recognizing that using these stimulant medications, especially long-term, we can see alterations in the brain development, 
um, those alterations may occur in the very regions that we're trying to treat. Uh, but the challenge is that we are replacing the brain's own processes with this external uh, medication. So with that said, it's taking the place of the brain's own production, the brain's own development. So for example, when you have stimulants that are increasing dopamine and norepinephrine, then the brain may overcompensate and stop producing as much of its own or may cut down on the number of receptors to try to compensate for this high amount coming in. And then that can be really challenging to um, sustain over time because we're going to develop more dependence. We're going to need higher doses over time. And then when we try to stop using them, it can be more challenging. Um, we, we've we developed a, a sort of dependence on these medications. And then this can also set us up to seek other sources to uh, fulfill that reward center there. So these are important things to recognize. Ones that are less common, but a risk that should be um, informed is the cardiovascular effects. We do see that stimulants can increase our heart rate, our blood pressure. And so of course, people already have pre-existing cardiovascular conditions. This needs to be considered. It can affect our sleep. So again, if part of the, the pattern in their brain is related to sleep disruption, then more sleep disruption might not actually help. Um, we may see some behavioral changes. Sometimes people report that they feel like they've kind of lost their kid, that they're just not the same. Um, if they've got a pattern that is already contributing to, say, anxiety or heightened emotional experiences, and then you go and heighten that more, then you can see uh, more extreme swings there. And long-term use has been associated with some suppression of growth in children. So um, these are just all things not to scare anybody. It's just part of the education process that we need to be aware of some of the risks, just like any other medication, any other, even the foods that we're eating, we need to be aware of just like, okay, I can choose to use this, but I need to be aware of the risk as well. So then that's one of the reasons that if the medication is not absolutely necessary, I personally prefer to use more natural methods. This is where the transcranial alternating current stimulation can be really helpful to boost specific frequencies, uh, promote more of that synchrony and balance in the brain. And there are studies really showing that this has significant effects on attention, memory, a lot of the various symptoms. The transcranial direct current is working with more of our GABA and glutamate. So it can help to reduce areas that are overactive or boost up underactive areas. So again, it can improve the associated symptoms there. PEMF or pulse electromagnetic is using these low intensity electromagnetic fields and has been shown to not only help with specific frequencies, but also help with cellular communication. It improves blood flow and uh, has also been found to do things like reducing inflammation, boosting our neuroplasticity. So neuroplasticity is important for learning processes, right? Photobiomodulation could be really effective, especially if we're seeing that somebody is showing signs of mitochondrial dysfunction. Mm -hmm. It can also help boost just overall energy, blood flow, oxygen in the brain, and the types uh, that are made for the brain often have the ability to choose specific brainwave frequencies and help to balance those out as well. And then, of course, neurofeedback training is where we get into the um, 
ingraining of those patterns. We're teaching the brain how to continue producing those healthier patterns ongoing. And we pair that with the visual and auditory cues and rewards to reinforce these desired brainwave patterns. So over time, the brain learns how to do it on its own. The person also learns that self-regulation. And then we see that the brain starts to change its structure, both gray and white matter structure. We see changes in the brainwave patterns and the connectivity patterns. And this is how we're seeing more of the lasting benefits from these types of neurotherapies. So those all fall under the umbrella of neurotherapy. These are technology-based interventions that can help alter the, the brain activity. And then the biofeedback is where we can really work on regulating the nervous system. We have found that the more regulated we are, then the better we're able to engage our more prefrontal and cognitive areas of the brain. So this is important for just managing and coping with our stressors. Neuropeptide therapy can be really helpful for enhancing our cellular function, especially mitochondrial function. We have certain types that can increase brain growth factors, so help promote the growth of new neurons, the growth of new synapses or connections. Um, it's really great at helping repair tissues in the brain. So again, depending on the client, but this could be especially helpful for those who have mitochondrial dysfunction or concussion underlying some of their symptoms. And then we also want to look at balancing dopamine. So dopamine is a neurotransmitter that we have found strongly associated with ADHD symptoms. It plays a big role in our attention as well as our motivation and reward. And one of the things that we see in our society is that we're on this dopamine roller coaster. And a lot of times we're looking for, oh, okay, I don't have enough dopamine. How do I get more dopamine? <laughs> Right, and we search on Google and find all the things to boost our dopamine. But dopamine is tricky because when you get a whole bunch of it, you also are going to dive just as deep. <laughs> so we need to look at balancing dopamine rather than just getting more of it. And in fact, when we uh, expose ourselves to what we call cheap dopamine, so these are like those really quick fix, short-term rewards. So unfortunately, screen time can do this. Even just the blue light of our phone has been found to release dopamine. So we look at our phone, we get a dopamine hit, and then we, you know, scroll through social media or whatever sites are out there now, and we're getting more dopamine hits. Uh, we're eating junk food that's also designed to give us dopamine hits. And all of these are actually causing our dopamine to plummet even deeper. And when we do this over time, that's where you see this line here, where the baseline just gets lower and lower. And we don't ever return to that healthy baseline of activity. So the goal is actually balancing dopamine like this line, where we want it to just come up a little bit, come back down just normal everyday rewards is going to be what allows us to have more of that sustained healthy reward processing or sustained attention and a lot of just the everyday healthy things that we already know, exercise, sleep, <laughs> mindfulness practices, social connections, just living in alignment with the way we're designed to live, our nature tends to balance dopamine. And so we just want to be aware, especially with our kids, of these other things that it's not that we have to just cut them off entirely, but we do need to be aware and try to, you know, modulate it as much as we can. 
Now, I know that we're getting a little over time, so if anybody does need to go, feel free. I'm going to go ahead and finish up these slides so that you have all the information. We are recording this, as I mentioned before, so if you uh, would like the recording afterwards, we'd be happy to share. So I don't want to hold any of you captive, but I will finish out this last little piece here, and then I'll be available for questions after. Okay. So nutrition. Nutrition is very important for our brain <laughs> and especially for those who have ADHD. We found that it's really important to get the nutrients needed. So having a more balanced, nutrient-dense diet can be really effective for ADHD. That's not news. I mean, that's kind of for all of us. But some of the things that are particular for ADHD is omega-3 fatty acids. Those can be really beneficial. Our diet tends to be really high in omega-6 fatty acids. And we actually need a higher ratio of omega-3s to omega-6s. So we almost have to overcompensate with more omega-3s and really intentionally eat foods or even look at supplementation that helps boost this omega-3. That's going to be helpful for overall brain function and our attention, as well as reducing inflammation. Protein-rich foods can be important as well. And another one that sometimes can be harder to get into our kiddos, but this is going to stabilize blood sugar levels and this is also important for neurotransmitter production and function. The complex carbohydrates can also be really helpful. These um, carbohydrates get a really bad rap, and yet carbohydrate, it is actually hydrating the cells, and uh, our brain is mostly water. So we do need both water and we also need the other ingredients that are going to help us be able to store that water. Um, the micronutrients that tend to be really helpful for ADHD, vitamins um, like vitamin B or B vitamins. We also see that things like zinc, iron, magnesium are really important. And one of the ones that is the most consistent in the research is the food additives. So artificial colors, uh, we, we see a lot of these in a lot of the junk food and uh, it's crazy when you start looking at the ingredients, even like just Doritos, you look at how many colors are added to those. And unfortunately, some of these colors are actual chemicals that have been associated with um, ADHD symptoms and sometimes even just cutting those out or reducing them, we can see significant improvements in ADHD symptoms. Um, one of the studies that I found that was a really solid research found green number three was a, a big contributor. So just being aware of those colors um, and any other preservatives and flavors can also be chemicals that are impacting the chemicals in our brains and our bodies. Now, if you suspect some food sensitivities or allergens, sometimes elimination diets can be really helpful, or you can do certain testing that helps clarify which sensitivities are um, big ones for you. This is where naturopathic and functional medicine can come in. So we can use lab testing to identify any physiological imbalances that are contributing to the symptoms. We can look at if there's nutrient deficiencies, food sensitivities, uh, any sources of inflammation, if there's dysregulation of hormones and neurotransmitters. We can look at imbalances in the gut and then have more personalized recommendations specific to what each person needs to really address these physiological imbalances. Roundly. Now, sleep hygiene and circadian rhythm are also super important for all of us, uh, but can play a big role in ADHD symptoms. 
So one of the pieces beyond just getting adequate sleep when we can is also paying attention to our lighting. So our lighting is going to impact our circadian rhythm, which is essentially our sleep-wake cycle. But the circadian rhythm goes beyond that in that it's like the master clock of the entire body. So it's the master clock that controls all the other clocks, all the other cycles in the body. So when that clock gets off, then the other clocks are also going to be off. And that can lead to a lot of different health and mental health challenges and really significantly affect our brain function. And one of the best things you can do for this circadian rhythm is getting sunlight. Um, we'll uh, do a, another presentation down the road about the importance of sunlight and how a lot of times we uh, vilified it as the sun is bad and it's going to you know, give us cancer. And yet we need the sun. We have lived with the sun, well, for all of our existence. We can't exist without it. And there's so many things that it does for us. But one of the most important things is that it is regulating that internal clock. And when we get that earlier in the morning, or at least first thing when we wake up, it kicks in all these processes for the rest of the day, helping us to produce the things we need to produce to feel awake and alert and have attention and focus throughout the day. And then also trickling down to help release the melatonin at night to allow us to sleep. We want to be careful of blue light because blue light is most prevalent in the daytime when the sun is directly up in the sky. So even short periods of blue light exposure at night or after the sun goes down will tell our brain that the sun is still in the sky, thus inhibiting the production of melatonin and thus affecting the quality of our sleep. So just being conscious of our blue light or LED screen exposure at night. Um, if you can't limit the screen time in and of itself, then blue light blocker glasses can be really helpful. Uh, you want to go for the full-on blue light blockers. They're going to be more orange tinted uh, as opposed to just like built-in prescriptions that are clear. Those are only reflecting blue light. So you want to go for the full-on blocking. And happy to provide some resources for that as well. Physical activity is really important. Physical activity helps us produce dopamine, in fact, but helps balance it. And it also has been found to improve focus and attention, uh, especially for if we're feeling a lot of restlessness and difficulty sitting still, then sometimes getting that activity out is really important. This is one of the things that is sad about some of our punishment systems at schools is they lose recess and then they have to go sit in time out indoors under LED lighting. And um, I, I wish that there could be systems where they actually get to get outside in the sunlight and release some of that energy that got them in trouble in the first place. So this is important to just recognize both for adults and for kids that this physical activity is really important. Mindfulness and meditation, this is also really helpful to train the mind to be able to stay present and in the moment, attentive. It can be helpful for when the mind is wandering of bringing it back. Just, okay, it wanders, gently bring it back. And the more you practice that over and over and over, the easier it gets, right? This can also be taught to kids. A lot of times we think that kids can't meditate, but there are quite a lot of programs out there now that are showing that kids can learn to meditate and it can be really powerful, really effective for them. And then here are some strategies that can help ADHD children. So sometimes routines can be really helpful. Just show them an example of the structure, the predictability. Uh, it can help reduce the stress, especially when their brain's trying to 
take in all the information. It's like, okay, this is the one thing that I can count on. I've got repetition here. Positive reinforcement is really important, especially when the reward systems are uh, not functioning at their best, when we are getting upset and um, punishing a lot, then that's not actually helping build up that reward center. If we can really reward what we want to see and encourage the, the positive habits, that's also going to uh, enhance the functioning of those reward centers and it's going to build up their self-esteem. We want to try to minimize distractions when necessary, especially if they're needing to focus on a task. So having a more calm, organized environment, less visual and auditory distractions can be helpful. This is also something that can be requested at school if they're needing to take a test, trying to take a test in a room with a whole bunch of other kids who are all fidgeting and making noises that's going to be a lot harder. So if they can have a space where they can, you know, really focus without those distractions, it just um, makes less of an uphill battle. And then at teaching coping strategies. So fidget toys can be really helpful um, just to kind of get some of that movement. Sometimes that fidgeting is actually trying to keep the brain awake if they're more of the slow brainwave pattern then the brain is actually afraid of falling asleep. And so it's trying to move to keep it awake. And fidget toys can be a good way to just kind of keep that going when they have to sit still. Breathing exercises can be really good for stress reduction and also getting more of that oxygen to the brain, helping to keep the prefrontal cortex activated. When stress kicks up, then it's going to actually suppress the prefrontal cortex that may already be struggling and it's going to make it even harder. So the breathing helps calm down the emotion centers, boost up the prefrontal cortex, and it just helps them cope better with everything that life is going to bring to them. So, and then for adults, uh, I'm a big fan of learning to ask for what we need <laughs> It can be really hard, especially in the workplace. And um, so, you know, whatever we can do to really support our success in our work environment, um, we, we may be able to get some flexible hours, utilize headphones that cancel out the noise and distractions. Um, we also might need to look at, you know, if we're really struggling in a specific job, is that really of interest to us? Is that job in alignment for us? Because um, one of the other variables with the ADHD pattern in the brain, especially if it's more of that theta pattern, is that when, when it's already going a little slower in the attention centers, and then you have something that is really boring and not of interest to you, it's going to go even slower. <laughs> so then it's like this pulling teeth or starting a train trying to get yourself to do these like tedious mundane things that you don't want to do. So sometimes it's not just about adjusting ourselves to our job or to our life, but also looking at what kind of job, what kind of activities would allow us to really embrace our strengths and really um, be of interest to us. And that interest is what kicks our brain in. It, it's going to activate it more, which then makes it easier to focus and have the motivation. So just something worth considering. But also, you know, if you're in school there's a lot of things that can be done to help. And a lot of times it's a matter of just, you know, requesting some of these things. Uh, you may have a, a therapist or a doctor write a note for you if they're requiring it. Most, including myself, are more than happy to do so. And then counseling and coaching can be really helpful to 
really learn how to manage this in our lives, how to utilize it to the best of our ability uh, as a strength, right? And um, just working through the different challenges of daily life, learning skills. So uh, I think this can be hugely helpful to um, help us for the rest of our life be able to not only cope, but thrive. So those are all the little pieces about ADHD that I wanted to share in this presentation. Uh, if you do have questions beyond this webinar, you're more than welcome to reach out. Uh, you can visit our website, www.neurogrowth.com. Uh, we do also offer complimentary consultation calls if you're interested in exploring like an assessment. And we're also happy to provide referrals and recommendations. So you don't have to come to us. Uh, we're happy to still chat with you and help point you in the right direction, especially if you're not in our area.